Remember I was saying that um, if you know certain types of uh, physical diagnostic findings, certain, uh, certain types of uh, laboratory tests and what they mean, how you can oftentimes make the diagnosis. Well, I can tell you for a fact that if you know how to interpret a B1 creatinine ratio, you'll get a lot of questions right, okay? And will they give you the ratio? No. But will they give you the B1 value and the creatinine value? Yes. Okay, so this is very important. I'd listen up on this because you'll be able to separate out prerenal azotemia versus renal failure by a simple BUN creatinine ratio. If you know what it means, you know how to do it, you'll get a lot of questions right and a lot of other people will get it wrong. It's very, very, very simple. Now, BUN means blood urea nitrogen. Creatinine, you know, is the end product of creatine metabolism. You know that urea can be filtered and reabsorbed in a proximal tubule, so it's not a perfect clearance substance. You know that creatinine is, uh, is only filtered in the kidney and is either reabsorbed or secreted, so that makes it not a perfect um, uh, clearance substance, but the one that we commonly use uh, for creatinine clearance. Actually, inulin clearance is a lot better because that, that actually... Uh, creatinine can be secreted or, uh, in other places, for example, the gut in very, very high levels. And in some cases, they actually can be secreted. So it's not really the perfect one, but it's good enough. All right. Now, if you take the normal uh, blood urea nitrogen level, which is roughly 9, 10 rather, and the normal creatinine level, which is usually 1 milligram per deciliter, uh, you should have basically a, a normal ratio would be 10 to 1. Agreed? Okay. When you have pre-renal azotemia, azotemia means an increase in BUN. That's what the term azotemia means. Pre means what? Before renal, before renal. So it's something, there's nothing wrong with the kidney. The problem is, is that your cardiac output's decreased. Any cause you know of a decrease in cardiac output, be it uh, congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, hypovolemia, anything you can think of, where the cardiac output is decreased, will produce a pre-renal azotemia. Why? Okay, because your glomerular filtration rate will decrease. If you have less renal blood flow, guys, you're going to filter less. It's just that simple. Your glomerular filtration rate will decrease. So what will that do? Well, when it decreases, that gives the proximal tubule a little bit more time to reabsorb a little bit more urea than it normally would when the glomerular filtration rate is normal. So you're going to get an increased proximal tubule reabsorption of urea, okay? Now, what about creatinine? Well, we know that it's not reabsorbed, but we do know that you have to get rid of it through the, through the kidneys. And so even though it's not reabsorbed, if the glomerular filtration rate is decreased, there'll be a backup of it, okay? And you're not going to be able to clear it as fast. And so there will be an increase in serum creatinine, okay? Not that much in comparison to the increase in urea because it is being reabsorbed. So there's a disproportionate increase in BUN over the creatinine. And all you've got to remember is uh, 15 to 1. Is that what I have up there? 15 to 1. So greater than a 15 to 1 BUN creatinine ratio means prerenal azotemia. Now to make sure you understand what I just said. The patient uh, has congestive heart failure. Okay, so you already know what it should be. Serum BUN is 80, uh, creatinine is 2. Now, that's, both of them are elevated, but what's the BUN creatinine ratio? 40 to 1. That means it's prerenal azotemia. The patient does not have acute tubular necrosis. You mean you can just say that, just boom. Yep, I can. Mm -hmm. I can. And I am. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, let's say you truly have renal failure. You've got oliguria. You've got renal tubular casts in the urine. This patient's kidneys have failed. And you've got acute renal failure. Well, that's going to affect the urea and the creatinine equally. Okay? Because something's wrong with the kidney, so it has the same effect that it would have on the urea as it would creatinine. Both of them, you know, urea has to be filtered out of the, uh, through the kidney, and it's failed now. So does creatinine. And so what happens is both of them increase, but they increase proportionate to each other because they both have the same problem. Kidney screwed up, and so I, they can't get rid of urea, so it builds up. 
You can't get rid of creatinine, so it builds up too, but it, 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 it increases in proportion to each other because urea is not being reabsorbed anymore because the kidneys are shot. So example, <clears throat> BUN 80, creatinine 8. What's the ratio? 10 to 1. That means you have renal failure. Okay? So if you maintain that ratio of 10 to 1, even though your urea and creatinine are incre increasing, it means you have renal failure. If the ratio of V1 to creatinine is greater than 15 to 1, you have pre-renal azotemia. It's just that simple. And those are usually the numbers they give, 80 over 8, 80 over 2. Those are the common ones they get. So that's the concept of that. Don't worry about post-renal azotemia. That's for part 2. So that gets us into acute renal failure, the most common cause of which is ischemic, listen, listen, ischemic acute tubular necrosis. That's the thing that you worry about most when a patient's cardiac output decreases you, and they develop oliguria. That's the one that you pray it isn't. Now, remember, when a patient's cardiac output decreases and you have pre-renal azotemia, if you have a decrease in glomerular filtration rate, don't you have oliguria from that too? Sure. So that's, that's what causes the, uh, the nephrologist and the clinician such a, such you know, they get nervous because the patient, you know, has a decrease in cardiac output and they have oliguria. And you're starting to see the B1, B creatinine going up and you say, oh my God, what is it? Is it pre-renal or is it renal azotemia? Is this patient in renal failure? It's simple. You get a B1, creatinine, ratio greater than 15 to 1. They're still pre-renal. But if you don't take care of it, guess what they're going to develop? They're going to be, develop acute renal failure, ischemic acute tubular necrosis. In fact, the most common cause of ischemic acute tubular necrosis is not treating pre-renal azotemia. Okay. All right. Now, where am I getting all this information? New England Journal of Medicine, article, Medical Progress, Acute Renal Failure. One of the best articles ever written on it. So all this information I've given you is straight stuff right from there. Okay, so ischemic ATN is the absolute worst one to get. Okay, BUN creatinine ratio will still be uh, 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 roughly the same as normal, t roughly 10 to 1, 80 over 8. You're going to have this happening. You, this is another slide from a previous one that I showed you. This is looking reasonable. You can still see nuclei in that, but you're beginning to see like this one's fading out. These are lost in here, lost in here. Okay, look at these. These are really shot here. These are totally shot here. That's coagulation necrosis, right? <clears throat> and what will happen is these things will slough off, okay, block the lumen, and contribute to the oliguria, right? And uh, if you look in the urine, you're going to see casts. And the casts will be look like this with renal tubular cells in them. We call these renal tubular casts. So that combination of um, B1 creatinine ratio, of about roughly 10 to 1, oliguria, renal tubular cast, diagnosis, is the acute tubular necrosis. Okay? Now, the reason why this one has such a bad uh, prognosis is this. When you have an ischemic cause for a tubular necrosis, not only are you killing the, uh, the tubular cells, but the basement membrane gets damaged. That's the bad thing. So in other words, you're taking away the, away the structural integrity of that tubule as well. Okay? Not good. Because as I told you, uh, when you have liver damage and you damage liver cells, when the liver cells regenerate themselves, are they regenerating the sinusoids? Are they regenerating the triads? Are they? No, they're just regenerating themselves. Well, similarly, if the base of membrane isn't there, and let's say the patient has recovered from acute tubular necrosis or is in the process of doing that, can you regenerate a, a, a renal tubular cell where there's no base of membrane? No. And so you can see that the that the more uh, uh, necrosis that you have and the more that the basement membranes are destroyed, obviously the worse the prognosis because uh, you're never going to be able to regenerate them and you're never going to get back normal function again. That's what makes it such a bad, bad, bad disease. Okay. Now, I did tell you, I believe, on Monday, that there were two parts of the uh, nephron that were most susceptible to ischemia. And what were they? The straight portion of the proximal tubule and the thick ascending limb in what segment? Medullary segment. That's sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transport pump. So which, which parts of the nephron do you think are the ones that undergo this coagulation necrosis and sloughing off? 
those two. And so you'll see those fall off in the proximal tubule, and you'll see them falling off also in a thick ascending limb in the medullary segment. And that's all I really have to say about ischemic acute tubular necrosis. Now, you also know that Trevor taught you about drugs that were nephrotoxic, didn't you? Okay? And do you remember any of the names of those nephrotoxic drugs? How about genomycin? How about the aminoglycoside? Aren't they famous for nephrotoxicity? Okay, so just take a guess. If they're nephrotoxic, okay, what's the first thing they're going to hit when they get filtered from the, uh, from the uh, glomerulus? The proximal tubule. So nephrotoxic tubular necrosis related to drugs, okay, it just involves the proximal tubule. And interestingly, the basement membrane remains intact there. So what do you think about the prognosis of nephrotoxic acute tubular necrosis? Way better because of two reasons. One, you're only affecting the proximal tubules, not other parts. And two, you're not, not damaging the basement membrane. Here's what the New England Journal of Medicine said about the most common cause of nephrotoxic. It was aminoglycosides. They said that the second most common one was intra intravenous pilograms that die. That was number two. Now, let me tell you something. When I read that, I said to myself, ah, oh, that's not good. Why? Because who's the major per people that you see in a hospital? Older people. Guys, what's the glomerular filtration rate in an 80-year-old? What's the creatinine clearance? 40 millimeters, 4 mLs uh, of... Uh, uh, is it per minute? In other words, it's decreased. That's normal. All the people begin losing, uh, the creatinine clearance goes down and down and down. The glomerular filtration rate decreases and decreases and decreases as age occurs. Okay. So, this means then <clears throat> that if you're giving a drug that has no nephrotoxicity and you're giving the doses of that drug in the same amount as you would a young person who has a normal glomerular filtration rate, then you're killing them. And obviously, that's happening. Because if aminoglycosides is the most common cause of necrotoxic tubular necrosis, then obviously, clinicians are not decreasing the dose of the drug so that the patient doesn't get nephrotoxicity. Now you say, well, how are they going to know how to do that? Do you ever hear of a pharmacy? You see, every pharmacy and every hospital has a computer program that will calculate for free for you what dose to give a patient if their glomerular filtration rate is decreased. There's only two things you have to give them, the body weight of the patient and the serum creatinine. That's all you've got to give them. And they put that in the computer, and they can actually calculate very accurately what the creatinine clearance is just from that information. And then they can say, what drug you want to give them? I want to give them uh, an aminoglycoside, okay? And then based on that glomerular filtration rate for that patient, they can tailor the dose that you give the patient, how much and at what interval, so that the patient will not develop nephrotoxicity and be able not to go into this uh, entity. It's clear then, according to that article, even though they didn't say why that was, that people are not doing this. And we're killing the old people. Oh, that's a pretty strong statement. Well, it's true. It's true. It's true. What if that's your parent? What if that's you when you're old? Okay? So make it personal a little bit, and then maybe that might give you the impetus to make sure you never forget what I just told you. All old people who get medications especially if you know they have nephrotoxic they have nephrotoxic side effects, you better take advantage of that pharmacy thing and make sure that your patient gets the appropriate dose at the appropriate interval so they don't die because of your poor care of the patient. Understand? Good. All right. That's the end of that one. <clears throat> All right. Pyelonephritis. Here's the big thing for a pyelonephritis, guys. How are you going to separate it from a lower urinary tract infection? Actually, very easy. Now, who do we see acute pyelonephritis and lower urinary tract infections and more commonly anyway? <clears throat> Women. And why is that? They're short urethra. So let's make sure you understand this. Acute pyelonephritis is a systemic infection 
and it's a it's an infection of your kidney proper. Well, how should it get up in the kidney? Don't you have when the urine goes into the bladder? Uh, isn't there a, in that ureteral vesicle junction? Oh, doesn't the muscle squeeze on that so that there's no reflux of urine from the bladder into the ureter? In a in a normal individual, yes, that's true. But not all people have a normal vesicle ureteral junction. And so that what happens is, if you get a bladder infection and this junction is incompetent, you have what is called vesicle ureteral reflux, then infected urine now can reflux, particularly when you're micturating, when you're peeing, can reflux up into ureters and you get an ascending infection that can go all the way up into the kidney. That's called vesicle ureteral reflux. And so they'll ask you, what's the mechanism of all urinary tract infections, be it urethritis, cystitis, ureteritis, pelvitis, or pyelonephritis? Answer, ascending infection. Ascending from where? Right at the beginning of the urethra. Every woman, and has nothing to do with cleanliness whatsoever, has the same E. coli serotype that is in her stool at the introitus of her urethra and her vagina. That is just normal, okay? And so you can see that with trauma or with certain types of serial types of E. coli, it can from that point ascend right up the urethra into the bladder, and if you have an incompetent vesicle ureteral junction, up your ureters into your, into your kidneys. So all urinary tract infections are ascending, ascending from the beginning of the urethra on up. Now, when you have acute, colis, uh, acute cystitis, you have dysuria, that's painful urination, increased frequency, suprapubic pain, but do you have fever, yes or no? No. Do you have flank pain when you just pound gently on it? No. Will you have white blood cell casts, casts with neutrophils in them? No. Why? Because they develop where? In the renal tubule. They don't develop in a ureter. They don't develop in the bladder. They develop right up in the kidney in the tubule. So fever, flank pain, white blood cell cast means what? Acute pyelonephritis. There you go. Will you have all that information on a test? Sure. They'll tell you whether they have fever. <clears throat> they'll tell you whether they have flank pain. And they'll also tell you whether there's cast in the urine. Okay? So it's ascending infection mechanism incompetent vesicle ureteral junction. This usually shows up right at the uh, at newborn little girls. They start running into palms with this right away. And then, so that, that particular problem, okay? And that'll be a problem for the rest of their lives. Okay, now sometimes they can do urologic surgery to alter that junction and make it a little bit more competent, but that doesn't always work. I have a young lady last year that had that, both kidneys. She had a stent in there. Okay, because she had vesicle ureteral reflux, and one kidney was already gone from pyelo, so yeah, she had chronic, and now the other one was starting to go, and so she's actually in some problems here, because her only uh, thing now is renal transplant after a time. Nice, beautiful young lady. She's a third-year medical student. Now she's going to have problems big time. Big time. Started when she was a little girl. Okay, very important. This is very, very common, this thing, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to show you some pictures. This uh, here is a, is, a, is a kidney and a patient with pyelonephritis, and all these white spots in here are abscesses. Okay, so it's a, it's a, uh, it, this is acute pyelonephritis. Now, if you have constant and recurrent attacks of acute pyelonephritis, you can become chronic, just like any uh, acute inflammation left untreated can go chronic, right? Acute hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, okay? And you get chronic pyelonephritis, of course, you end up there at the risk of ending, uh, having hypertension and eventual renal failure related to that if both kidneys have chronic pyelonephritis. Now, let me show you this diagram to show how you're going to, on the boards, know that you have chronic pyelonephritis. Okay, you're going to have a scarred kidney. <clears throat> so this is showing a scar on the cortex. Now, look at this. This is the normal configuration of the renal calyces. And normally, you have a concave appearance. See that? See that? See that? When you have chronic pyelonephritis, because of all the inflammation and scar tissue, you get blunting of the calyces. That's what they call it. Blunting of the calyces. And notice that the blunting occurs right underneath where the scar is. So you see the scar? Blunt. 
Scar blunt. Can you see that on an intravenous pilogram? You bet. And when you see it, what does it mean? Chronic pilonephritis. Are you saying that they actually had an intravenous pilogram with blunting of the calyces on part one? Yes, I am. Part two? Yes, I am too. So what does blunting of the calyces mean, please? Chronic pilonephritis. Very good. Now, can drugs produce a type of nephritis involving the interstitium and tubules. Oh yeah, it can be acute, it could be chronic, okay, and it's going to be easy to diagnose. You want to know why? Because you're going to have fever when you're taking that drug and you're going to develop a rash. Now anyone with half a brain in their head should know that if you got a patient, you put them on a drug, let's say a penicillin drug for some, whatever it is, okay, and all of a sudden they start developing fever and develop a rash. If you're not thinking that that fever and that rash has something to do with the drug that you gave you. I mean, you've got to have rocks in your head. But then throw on top of that oliguria, okay? And, all right, all right, a little oliguria there. I mean, dog, there's a message coming from above. I think I'd worry about that drug there. We've got fever, we've got a rash, and we've got oliguria. And you can even throw on top of that, uh, they'll have uh, eosinophiluria. What does that mean? They get eosinophils in the urine which is absolutely pathognomonic for this. That's called acute drug-induced interstitial nephritis. And it's incredibly, it's becoming more and more common in the United States, and it's becoming a very common cause of chronic renal failure in patients. It relates to drugs, and if you look at Cecil's and all those books, there are so many drugs that can do this, it's unbelievable. Lasix can do this. Uh, all the penicillins can do this. In fact, methicillin is the prototype of acute interstitial nephritis related to drugs. So many, 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 many drugs. So what's the, what's the key? You put a patient on a drug, they get fever, they get a rash, and they have oliguria. Boom! Discard the drug, stop the drug, never give them that drug again. Because it's kind of a combination, type 1 hypersensitivity and type 4 hypersensitivity. Never give them that drug again, ever, ever. Otherwise, they can run into problems with renal failure. Good, got that done. Do these look normal? Say no. Why? Because it's pathology. Very good. <laughs> you guys are so good. You know, you guys are really good. And you play along. That, that's the nice part. You know, when you don't play along, you know, you're so serious and you can't take life nice. You've got to have a little bit of fun. This is not a funny situation, Dr. Goya, on my life is at stake. But at least, you know, come on. You've got to... You've got to kind of let up a little bit. You've got to let up a little bit. You've got to exercise. You've got to enjoy yourself a little bit. Okay, just consider it a temporary... No, it's not a setback. Not a setback. A temporary obstacle in your path to becoming a full-fledged physician. Even though most of you are already, okay, a good many of you, Unfortunately, in this country, they have to go and have you go through the whole thing again, which is absolutely retarded in my, appearance because, in my opinion, because I have found from my experience that foreign medical school grads are oftentimes, and most of the time, brighter than the ones we have from here. And so it makes me wonder why we do that. <laughs> I don't really know. I think it's really bad, personally. Okay. Now, this is abnormal because in the, uh, renal, uh, in, the, uh, in the renal medulla, we're having this, this, this discoloration. And as a matter of fact, if we look here, this is a pale infarct. And actually, if you look here, there's nothing there. The renal papilla went somewhere. Where did it go? Into the toilet bowl. That's called the ring sign. Because if you did an intravenous pilogram, there would be an empty space there. This is analgesic nephropathy. This is that combination of acetaminophen plus aspirin, deadly duo, over a long period of time, cumulative. Acetaminophen is producing free radicals. And remember, because of the poor circulation in the medulla, it's doing some free radical damage on the tubular cells in the medulla. Then you throw on top of that aspirin, What's that going to block? PGE2, which is normally a vasodilator. And so who's in control of your renal blood flow now? Angiotensin 2, and what is it? It's a vasoconstrictor. I've got some more bad news for you. A vasoconstrictor, what vessel? 
the efferent arterial, guess what the, where the peritubular capillaries derive from? The efferent arterial. So by having vasoconstriction constriction of the efferent arterial, are you affecting all those peritubular capillaries that are going around? You're collecting tubules in your renal medulla? Uh-huh. So is that producing ischemia? Yes. So you have free radical damage and ischemia. No wonder why the renal papilla necrose and get slumped, and that's called renal papillary necrosis. Okay? So aspirin and acetaminophen combination can do that. Uh, another totally different thing that can do this is di di uh, diabetic uh, nephropathy can do this too because of ischemia. Another thing, acute pyelonephritis because of abscess formation can do this. Sickle cell, sickle cell trait and disease can do this too, but for different mechanisms than, uh, than the aspirin and acetaminophen. Understand? Okay. Chronic renal failure. It's kind of a... Chronic renal failure is a kind of a good test on a student, I think. Let's say you're, you have chronic renal failure, which means that you have a B1 creatinine ratio of 10 to 1 for more than three months. By definition, that means you have chronic renal failure, according to the definitions. Okay, without looking at this, we should be able to figure out what would go wrong if, you're re if both kidneys fail. Okay, so let's think. Okay, well, first of all, uh, we're not going to be able to excrete the things that we normally excrete. Okay, so those things will build up, so we'll probably retain salt and stuff like that, huh? Let's think about erythropoietin. Are we going to be able to make that? No, so what should we end up with? Normal acidic anemia, corrective reticular side count, less than 2%. Okay, so that's going to happen. How about getting rid of all those organic acids that we have to get rid of on a daily basis? Are we going to be able to get rid of them? No, so what's that going to produce? Metabolic acidosis, increased gap or normal gap? Increase gap. Okay, if you have metabolic acidosis, do bones try to buffer all that acid? Sure, so bones are buffering your excess hydrogen ions. What could you develop? Bone disease, like what? Osteoporosis. Are the proximal tubules screwed up in chronic renal failure? Sure, is there an enzyme there? Sure, it's called 1-alpha hydroxylase. And so what does that normally do? The second hydroxylates vitamin D, so what else are you going to have whenever you have renal failure? Hypovitaminosis D, you have vitamin D deficiency. Okay, so what does that mean? You're going to get hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia. So what does that mean? You're going to have osteomalacia. So you have two bone diseases. You have osteoporosis because you're buffering and, and just wearing away the entire bone matrix. And you also have osteomalacia. Your legs start going out like that. And what's your parathyroids doing when you have this chronic hypocalcemia? Well, they're reacting to it by putting out more parathermone, which again is going to be ripping away at your bone. Okay, but what do we call that type of, of parathyroid? Is that primary hyperparathyroidism or is that secondary? Secondary hyperparathyroidism. There you go. Okay, and then of course the B1 creatinine ratio is like 80 over 8 and things like that. So yeah, I hit most of the key things in here. Uh, that one sees, and that's basically all you, all you really need to know. You can actually basically, if you know what normal renal function is, you can figure out what happens when it fails. Are these normal? Say no. Why? This is pathology. Very good. What if I told you this patient has essential hypertension over 10 years? And it's been not very, very well controlled because the person was non-compliant, didn't take their medication. So that's pretty much 10 years of, of really poor uh, blood pressure control. So we got a kidney that looks like this, and that cobblestone appearance. What do we call that? Nephrosclerosis. And what's the underlying disease that's causing that cobblestone shrunken kidney? Hyaline arteriolosclerosis. Because there's decreased blood flow, you're getting tubular atrophy, the glomeruli are fibrosing off, renal function starting to go down, and eventually you can go into renal failure related to this. But let's say this same person then one day wakes up with an incredible headache and has blurry vision, and is really, really hurting big time. He's getting a little dizzy, goes to the doctor, blood pressure is 240 over 140. Okay, you look in the retina, the dude has, has papilledema with flame hemorrhages. And hard and soft exudates, grade 4, hypertensive retinopathy, BON creatinine ratio, 80 over 8. This dude's in big time trouble. What's he got? Malignant hypertension. Okay? That's what this is. They call this oftentimes the flea-bitten kidney. I don't know where the fleas are, but whatever. 
they call it a flea bitten kidney because oftentimes you don't really see it too well here except maybe there, there, and there. They're basically petechia, actually, uh, that are visible on the surface of the kidney. And that's because of, of these vessel um, changes. Remember that hyperplastic arteriolo sclerosis we said with the onion skinning? That's there. And these blood vessels are rupturing and basically producing kind of petechial lesions on the cortex. That's the term flea bitten kidney. That's basically all you need to know except one more thing. They do ask treatment on this, and let's see what you say the treatment is. How are you going to get the blood pressure down? Intravenous nitroprusides, the answer. And that's as far as they go with malignant hypertension. So in other words, you notice that they have central nervous system edema and, and the papal edema, and you get, don't get that blood pressure down. They're going to stroke out, uh, and they're going to die. I want you to look at this kidney, please. Okay? You see anything abnormal? Say yes. Okay. Do you see uh, any areas that are pale and kind of depressed looking? Yeah, kind of pale, and that looks kind of depressed. Pale, kind of depressed. That doesn't mean that's sad. It just means that it's sunken in a little bit, okay? Okay, so it's pale and it's depressed. So if I took a section right through one of those things, and I told you also that this patient had an irregular, irregular pulse, what do you think I'd see? I'd see pale infarction with coagulation necrosis because what you're looking at are infarcts. Okay, and remember, because this is a pretty solid organ, uh, instead of being hemorrhagic, they're going to be pale. And with that history, I clearly told you the mechanism for it. What was a regular, regular pulse? Atrial fib. And what is atrial fib most dangerous for? Embolization. And so they produce multiple emboli, unfortunately in this case, to the kidney, producing multiple pale infarcts of the kidney. This exact picture was on board. Many, many people missed. You know what they called it? Pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis with big areas like that. Pyelonephritis would have little white dots all over the micro abscesses. And look at this. These things are depressed. What does that have to do with an irregular, irregular pulse anyway? <laughs> Nothing is the answer to that question. That woke a couple people up. I'm sorry I was doing too close over here. This guy doesn't even respond. It was just nothing. Nothing happened to this guy. That's why he's wearing his hat. There's two reasons why he's wearing his hat. He's not going to get spit on, and secondly, he can put the hat down, and I can't see his eyes closed. <laughs> now, he's been very attentive, actually. I like this kid. He's a good kid. He is a kid, too. My, my son is, is about 11 years older than you. You could be a grandson to me, actually. <laughs> You're so young. All right. Have you seen this before? Yes, you did, but in a smaller version. Under what growth alteration? Atrophy. Because what is this? This dilatation of the renal pelvis, please. Hydronephrosis. So when you have hydronephrosis, an increased pressure pressing on the cortex and medulla, what happens to that? You get ischemia and atrophy. We call this compression atrophy. Very similar in a sense, to the cystic fibrosis ducts that are filled with the inspissated mucus, pressures impacted back on the glands, they undergo compression atrophy. Okay. So remember, this picture's been on many exams, guys. Now look at it. Look how thin the cortex and medulla are. And gosh, look at this. These are very dilated, very, very dilated renal pelvises. Now what's the most common cause of this? Stone. All right. This exact picture was on boards. Name me. Staghorn calculus. Big deal. What's the urine pH? Alkaline. What's it smell like? Well, I don't smell urine. I'm sorry. I'm not answering. Oh, you better answer. What's the urine smell like? Ammonia. So that means, therefore, there must be a what enzyme, what, what organism would have to be doing this? A urease producer. And what do you think it most commonly is? Proteus. There you go. You learned that in microbiology. And it's because the urease produces, they break urea down into ammonia, you get an alkaline pH, and that's why a staghorn, calcium, uh, staghorn calculus is magnesium, listen, ammonium phosphate. Okay, and it only develops in patients that have infections due to urease producers. E. coli is not a urease producer, but proteus species are, 
and they predispose to these stones. Now, fortunately, you don't pass these stones. Okay, can you imagine passing that stone in your urethra? <laughs> I mean, I mean, no. No. Oh, can we get lithotripsy on this and break it up? Sure, if you want 15,000 bouts of renal colic, yeah, I think that would be a good thing. I kind of like that idea because I love pain. Oh, that's nice. Then you need to see a psychiatrist before you see a urologist. Okay? You're going to have to extract these things. You know, you're going to have to do surgery and remove it. In fact, might as well take the kidney with it because it's ruined. So they love the staghorn calculus question and showing this picture and asking you about the microbiology behind it, okay? And so it's urease producer, alkaline urine pH, ammonia smell to urine. Okay, we're talking now. Could you focus this? I know this does a little bit better. The other way. That's good. I wanted that to be. We're talking about tumors of the kidney. I'm going to make this easy for you, okay? This is a kidney, all right? So you gotta, got to start there, okay? Can you see at least that there's something wrong up here, like a mass up there, yes or no? Okay. If you see a mass in a kidney and it's an adult, it's a renal adenocarcinoma. If they said that this was a kid, just call it a Wilms tumor, because Wilms, kids get Wilms tumors, adults get renal adenocarcinomas, okay? So anytime you see a big old mass in a kidney, don't pick metastasis, things really go there. Don't pick something benign, it's cancer. And it's a renal adenocarcinoma if it's an adult, or, or it's a Wilms tumor if it's a kid. Okay? They derive from the proximal tubule, and the most common cause is smoking. They make lots of ectopic hormones, erythropoietin. What else? Parathormone-like peptides. So what does that produce? Hypercalcemia. Very good. They have a nasty habit of doing what? because they don't know that they're a carcinoma. Invade the renal vein. They like to do that too. I don't think I have much more to say about renal adenocarcinoma. This is what they look like. They're very clear cells. Actually, they're full of, uh, of glycogen. And that's that. You know what, remind, you know what I remind you? The last, the last thing I said yesterday, I should have told you, I think I said actinomycin was the treatment for cryptococcus, I hope you all, or the cryptococcus histo thing, I hope you realize that was a stupid, very dumb statement. It was made in the process of being extremely tired. It really was what? Ampoterracin. <laughs> you were very nice to me, you didn't all scream out, Ampoterracin, you just accepted it and knew that it was just plain stupid and tired. Okay, that was nice, I appreciate it. All right, now listen to this, and this is how you're gonna get this right, okay? I don't like this. This is a kid. I hate anything bad in kids, but we have to show it to you. Do you see anything wrong with his back? He's got a flank mass. I'm going to say he's got a flank mass and he has hypertension. What does he have to have? Wilms tumor. There you go. He's got a flank mass. He's got hypertension. He's got a Wilms tumor. What's the hypertension due to? It's making renin. It's making renin, and that's producing the hypertension. It's about the fourth most common cancer in kids usually unilateral, and produces a flank mass usually, okay? The histology is kind of interesting. What does this look like? It looks like a little baby glomerulus, okay, in a sense. What it is, Wilms tumor is a cancer where you're duplicating the embryogenesis of the kidney. So everything is primitive. It's like it should be in a fetus, except the kid's an adult, and it's malignant. And so we see these things. We see even rhabdomyoblasts with striations. It's a horrible thing. It likes to metastasize to the lung. There are certain types that are autosomal dominant, and they involve chromosome 11, and you better know this. They have two physical diagnostic findings that are consistent on exams. One is aniridia. That means an absent iris. And the second is hemihypertrophy of an extremity, meaning that one extremity will be bigger than the other. That's a sign that the Wilms tumor has a genetic basis. The big one they hit the most is aniridia, the absent iris in the eye. Okay, I want to show you the most common urine abnormality that we actually see in a laboratory, and that's the abnormality associated with a lower or upper urinary tract infection. 
And what we're going to do at the same time is explain a little bit of those dipstick things and what you would expect to see in a, in a run-of-the-mill lower urinary tract infection or acute pyelonephritis. So let me introduce you to uh, some of these cells here. The arrow is pointing to what neutrophils look like in urine. Okay, they're just kind of granular little things. You really you can't really see the trilobes, but these are neutrophils, okay? Now, I think this you can easily tell what that is. It kind of has a reddish hue to it, so does that. So what are those? Red blood cells. And if this was a true specimen, these little things here would be kind of jiggling around like Brownian movement. Okay, they would be jiggling around, so those must be bacteria. And if you're going to play odds on what it would be, it would be E. coli. So what we have are neutrophils, RBCs, and bacteria. Now, the dipstick will pick up all three of these things. Okay, on the dipstick, we have a dipstick portion that picks up blood. And so we would uh, get a positive uh, dipstick for blood because of these RBCs. I mean, only two in a high-power field would be, yep, it's that sensitive. Mm -hmm. So hematuria is very frequent. In fact, in some cases, and I'm sure some of you women can attest to that, it can be really hemorrhagic, and you actually can see blood come out. It's called hemorrhagic cystitis. And, so, and most of the time, that's E. coli, but sometimes it's adenovirus is famous for hemorrhagic cystitis. So we'd have a positive dipstick for blood because of these. Now, also, the dipsticks have leukocyte esterase, and that's measuring the enzyme in leukocytes, okay? So we would have a positive dipstick for leukocyte esterase because there are neutrophils here, so that'd be positive. Third... Most urinary pathogens are nitrate reducers, which means they convert nitrate to nitrite. And on a dipstick, they have a little section there for nitrites. And of course, since E. coli is a nitrate reducer, there should be nitrites in the urine. Dipstick positive for that. So if you've got a patient, woman or man, who has uh, dysuria, Increased frequency, suprapubic pain, and then you have a, uh, a urinary tra urine uh, 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 sediment that has neutrophils, RBCs, and also uh, bacteria or dipstick findings of hematuria, leukocyte esterase positive, nitrate positive. That's a urinary tract infection. Now, your next step is, is it lower or upper? So, how are you going to tell the difference there? Well, if the patient has fever, what would it be? Upper. If the patient has flank pain, what would it be? Upper. If the patient has white blood cell cast, what would it be? Upper. If none of those things are present, what do they have? Lower. Good. Now here's a trick. You ready? Let's say you have someone with this urine increased frequency. They have neutrophils in the urine, maybe even a couple RBCs, but you don't see a single bacteria there at all. You culture it, and it's totally negative for bacteria, but the patient does have dysuria. The patient does have positive leukocyte esterase, nitrite, nitrite's negative, the standard urine culture is negative, and it's a sexually active person. What do you think? It's chlamydia. It's chlamydia. Chlamydia. You see, the normal urine cultures don't pick up chlamydia. It's, uh, it's the most common sexually transmitted disease. It's chlamydia. Chlamydia trachomatis. In men, we call it nonspecific urethritis. And women, we call it the acute urethral syndrome. Okay. Uh, we also use a term called sterile pyuria. In the sense that that means we don't have bacteria present, but we do have neutrophils present. The routine bacterial cultures are negative. Okay. So we, we call that sterile pyuria. So now you know one cause of sterile pyuria is, not, is, a, is, a, is a chlamydial infection. But another one they're looking for, guys, is tuberculosis. See, the most common organ that, that, that the miliary TB goes to is the kidney. And so you're going to have TB in the urine, and it will host a pyuria in the urine, and it will be sterile because, you know, urine cultures don't pick up TB. And so that would be another example of sterile pyuria. So the two I want you to remember are chlamydia, okay, and TB as causes of that. Okay, you've seen this before. This is a little papillary lesion in the bladder. Okay, this is the bladder that's been removed. There's a big papillary lesion over here. What's the most common cause of transitional cell carcinoma in the bladder? Smoking. And what's that dye? Aniline dye. And what's that chemotherapy agent used in treating uh, Wegener's? 
cyclophosphamide. What's another complication of cyclophosphamide other than this? Hemorrhagic cystitis. And how do you prevent that from happening? Mesna. Very good. That's wonderful. Good. Penis. Well, what's there important to say about that? No, only kidding. Okay. They asked these two things on the embryology, guys. That's the embryology of hypospadias. That's where you have an opening on the undersurface. That's where you pee and it goes on your shoes. Failure or closure of the urethral fold. Better learn your embryology here, okay? Make sure you know this. Of course, it's in the, it's in the notes, and that's good enough. Epispadius is a little less common, thank God, because that's on the surface. That means it goes in your face, okay? And if you've got epispadius and hypospadius, you've got to go in two plates, okay? So you kind of have to stand like this most of the time, you know, and it just kind of goes up like that and goes down there. That's, uh, an epispadius is a, a defect in a geni genital tubercle, okay? These are very important things. Perineus diseases like Dupuytren's contracture of the penis, okay? Kind of goes this way, that way, or blankly, this way, straight up, whatever, okay? Preoptism is you have a permanent erection. You see that reasonably common in sickle cell disease because of the red blood cells, those sickle cells getting trapped in the vascular channels. Very painful, very painful. Now, listen, careful. Most common cancer of the penis is squamous, and the most common reason is lack of circumcision. Always ask that. Now listen carefully on this. It's more commonly seen in an uncircumcised person. That's true. But it's an uncircumcised person that has poor hygiene. In other words, they're not cleaning underneath there. Okay? That's the person. The person that has that smegma, which is carcinogenic, those individuals are at great risk for developing squamous carcinoma of the penis. So it's poor Hygiene of an uncircumcised state. If there's good hygiene, no, no problem at all. That's been very commonly asked, that particular question, apparently. And then, of course, these two things, the hypo and epispadius, the embryology. Okay, testicle, or in Greek, testicle. Okay. Probably the most important testicle thing is a cryptorchid test. That's a dude that don't want to come down. Remember, there's two phases to the descent of a testicle. The first is a transabdominal migration. Oh, that's cool. Sounds like transam to go on an airplane. Okay, I want to go to an airplane down to the inguinal. Okay. And guess who's responsible for that? The thing that you guys and me thank God every day for. What was that dude that took away all our Mullerian structures by apoptosis. Mullerian inhibitory factor, yay, yay, yay. It also helps that little testicle make its first trip to the opening of the inguinal canal. Now, the second part of the trip is androgen dependent. And that, and that would include testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. So the first phase is Mullerian inhibitory factor. The second phase is androgen dependent. Now, listen careful. You've got to get that little dude down into the scrotal sac by minimum two years of age. Why? The risk of seminomas. But listen to this. Even if you did get it down there before, you're still at risk. Now listen to this. Let's say you went in and looked at it, and the thing is all atrophic and absolutely worthless, and you take it out and you leave the normal one on the other side. That testicle's at risk, too, even though it's not cryptorchid. So what's the moral of this story? The moral of the story is that whether it's in and whether it's out and you've left behind a normal one, you have to have your testicles examined once a year to make sure that you don't develop a seminoma, which is a germ cell tumor. Now I've got an analogy for you that will help you. As you know, in Turner syndrome, they are uh, infertile. They have menopause before they have menarche. Because by two years of age, they have no follicles at all in their ovaries. And they call that a street gonad. So, a, so an ovary without any follicles is called a street gonad. Can we make that analogous to a cryptorchid testis? Let's do it. And so just like the cryptorchid testis predisposes to seminomas, which is a germ cell tumor, so does the street gonad predispose to a germ cell tumor, except in a woman... We don't call them seminomas, we call them dysgerminomas. So it's a very, very good correlation to remember. See, that's why patients that have been diagnosed with Turner syndrome, they remove surgically B 
both ovaries because of the great risk. Okay, they don't keep them in there because they will develop cancer. Okay, orchitis we've talked about in reference to mumps, so we don't need to talk about. This is kind of interesting. You always hear this. Epididymitis, less than 35, and Neisseria, gonorrhea, chlamydia, greater than 35, Pseudomonas E. coli. Is that implying that people over 35 don't get sexually transmitted diseases? It's kind of weird, but apparently it holds true. And it's been asked many, many times on examinations. Varicocele's big time on exams because there's an anatomy relationship. What side are those bag of worms located on? The left. Why is that? Because the spermatic vein on the left uh, is connected to the left renal vein, whereas the spermatic vein on the right is connected to the inferior vena cava. And because of that, abnormality, the pressures are greater, and you can get a varicocele on the left that produces increased heat, and it is one of the most common causes of male infertility, is a uh, varicocele. Now, the, the, the boards can't be outdone. They asked a very interesting question. They said, what would happen if you block the, uh, the left renal vein? You would develop a varicocele. That was pretty clever, I thought. So if you block the left renal vein, that's going to increase the pressure in the and that spermatic vein, and you'll get a varicocele. That was a very, very clever question, okay, because I wanted to see if you knew that relationship of the spermatic vein with the left renal vein. I thought it was pretty clever. Torsion, it just makes me cringe thinking about, thinking about my spermatic cord twisting. Twisting. Yet, it's asked on every part one and part two exam, big time. Okay, probably one of the dudes on the boards had this happen to them, okay? <laughs> And so they are immortalizing it with their, with, their, with their pain. Okay, now listen careful. Listen careful. <clears throat> when there's a torsion of the spermatic cord, that shortens it. So that means that testicle is going to go up a little bit, okay, into the inguinal canal. That's fact one. Fact two, it hurts. Fact three, you lose your cremasteric reflex. What does that mean? That means in a normal exam on a male, if you take a, a stick and scratch the, uh, the scrotum, it'll contract. Okay, that's called the cremasteric reflex. You lose it with torsion of the testicle. That's what they ask on boards. Don't do this test on a woman because they don't have a cremasteric <laughs> reflex. So nothing worse than seeing some idiot on a GYN case scraping over there. What are you doing? I'm looking for a cremasteric reflex. Oh? Oh? What school did you go to? Oh, Dr. Goyon told me about this. I always get blamed for everything. Hydrocele, remember, is persistence of the tunica vaginalis. Remember, when you have what looks like a big scrotum, you don't know whether it's big because there's fluid in it, or you don't know whether it's big because there's a testicle in it. So what do you do? Transilluminate. Okay? If it transilluminates, what is it? Hydrocele. If it doesn't, what is it? Cancer. You know what the differential diagnosis is for a painless enlargement of the testicle? Cancer, 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 and cancer. Really? That's the most, that's the differential diagnosis for painless enlargement of the testicle. Cancer, 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 and cancer. That's why they don't even do biopsies on them. They just plain remove them. And then they look at them. So the differential is cancer, 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 cancer. Okay, this is what a seminoma looks like, which is the most common. And thank God it is the most common one that we have. A seminoma because it's the one that has the best prognosis. Lance Armstrong didn't have this, though. He had an embryonal. And he had metastasis and stuff like that to his brain and liver. So he had a bad one, actually. Okay, but this is a seminoma. They look like this histologically. They have these big, big cells in them, and they have a lymphocytic infiltrate. This looks exactly like the counterpart in a woman's ovary called a dysgerminoma. They're exactly the same origin, except they call it dysgerminoma in a female, seminoma in a male. These things will melt with radiation. <laughs> Just go away. They usually have no tumor markers. Occasionally they have a little beta HCG, but it doesn't mean they have choriocarcinoma. So this is your most common one, guys. And where do they metastasize if they do? 
your paraaortic lymph nodes. Why? Because it came from the abdomen, and that's where it'll go. So you only need to know a couple most comments here, and we're done with the testicle here, and we can hopefully get get the prostate done before five, and we're done with this, and that'll be good, because we're in a good, good place for tomorrow to finish the rest of it off. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So let's not talk anymore, but say this. What's the most common testicular tumor in a kid? Think young. Yolk sac tumor. What's the tumor marker? Alpha fetal protein. What's the absolute worst testicle cancer that you can get? Corial carcinoma. See, the corial carcinoma in a male doesn't enjoy the same prognosis as a gestationally derived corial carcinoma in a woman. In other words, you're dead. You want to know how they ask the question? 25-year-old man has unilateral gynecomastia and dyspnea. Chest X reveals multiple nodular masses in the lung. So here's the combination. Gynecomastia, obvious metastatic disease. Question will be, where's the primary? Answer, testicle. And what is the primary? Corial carcinoma. Don't get it, doc. I don't get the gynecomastia part. Beta HCG is luteinizing hormone analog. It acts just like luteinizing hormone. Therefore, it stimulates... Uh, uh, progesterone in the male, which does increase duct growth and breast tissue and can produce gynecomastia. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. What if it's an older man like me? If I had uh, testicular cancer, what would it be? A malignant lymphoma. So older people get malignant lymphoma, not as a primary disease because there's no lymphoid tissue there, metastasis. The, the, the testes are, are big-time places for metastasis in leukemia and big-time places for metastasis in lymphomas, okay? So worst one, choreo, most common one, seminoma, most common in kid, yolk sac tumor, most common in old person, uh, metastatic malignant lymphoma. We're done with testicle, and then we just have prostate, and we're done for today. Uh, this was not the problem. They didn't stick one of these little things in there. Okay, that was just a, uh, what's that, a paper clip? Although I have seen patients that have done that. In fact, some patients stuck a candle up there, wazzy wazzy. That's not so good. I guess they had a problem with, uh, with uh, you know, finding their way into their room. So they put a candle there to make sure they can keep both hands free. I have no idea why they would do something that dumb, but whatever. <laughs> Okay, one gets the impression that because they put a paper clip here, it must be that this is pretty, pretty compressed. And this is hyperplasia, guys. Hyperplasia, it occurs in the periurethral portion of the prostate gland. That's why you get dribbling and urinary retention as the most common symptom of that. Prostate cancer is in the periphery of the prostate gland within realm of your finger. And so when you press on there, you feel hardness. That's prostate cancer land. So here's where you can get screwed up. If they say that a 75-year-old man has uh, urinary retention, okay, and his bladder is up to his umbilicus, in other words, he's 20 weeks pregnant with his bladder, okay, and he's got, uh, you know, dribbling and stuff like that, and they'll say, what's the most likely cause? Please don't pick prostate cancer. Why? <coughs> Because for prostate cancer to do that, it would have had to invade all the way through the prostate gland to around the urethra or into the bladder neck. It's prostate hyperplasia is the answer because it already is around the urethra and that's the most common cause, not cancer. That's a big time mistake, big time. So it's due to a combination of testosterone. Now, wait a minute. What hormone... Male hormone is totally responsible for prostate. Dihydrotestosterone. As a matter of fact, in embryogenesis, it was dihydrotestosterone that fused the labia together to form a scrotum, extend the clitoris to form a penis, and for free, it threw in a prostate gland. So in other words, prostate hyperplasia, and we'll find out prostate cancer is not a testosterone-dependent cancer, it's a dihydrotestosterone-dependent cancer. If you think about it, if you do a five, use a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which is one of the treatments for, for let's say, for, for cancer, wouldn't that increase testosterone? Or wouldn't that, wouldn't that have made it worse if testosterone has anything to do with prostate cancer? Of course it would. 
The point is, by giving a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, you decrease dihydrotestosterone, okay, which is the thing you wanted, plus the fact the cool part about the testosterone being increased is you get hair on your head. Okay, so that was that thing about there's a drug that you can use for treating prostate cancer, and you can sometimes use it for treating uh, hyperplasia, and you get hair on your head to begin with if you evolve. Okay, let me real quick. Uh, prostate cancer, this is that over here. And uh, that's also a dihydrotestosterone-dependent cancer. It's the most common cancer in man, and it also likes to metastasize the bone where it produces osteoblastic metastases. Good. We're in good stead for tomorrow. We should be able to finish off reasonably good.